Uh, Welcome to week two of our new series, Give Thanks for Nothing, No Hearts of Gratitude, Give Thanks for Everything. Again, what an uh, appropriate, relevant message for us to hear in these days. Uh, What we're going to do today for our second message in the series is we're going to take a look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. It's a beautiful beginning, introductory thought from the Apostle Paul to these Christians who lived in an ancient town of Ephesus. Uh, We are going to work through this text as best as we can with the time we have. This text is chock full of thoughts about why we should praise God for all spiritual blessings, for everything, to thank God for who he is, to thank God for God. So let me go ahead and read that to you here. It'll be up on the screen. And just meditate on the goodness of God as I read through it. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory and You also were included in Christ. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Wow, there's so much there, isn't there? God is good. We should always give thanks to him. And and that's our pursuit now, to really examine this message for the time that we have, to see how unique our God is and how much you are loved by God, even if you don't always see it. Before we jump into our message, though, let's, let's open with prayer. Sanctify us by the truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. So here's the map ahead of us for our message today. I'm going to give you three major points as I I look to group some of these descriptors of God and what he's done for us together in in groupings that that make sense, that kind of have a similar theme. So three main ideas that we'll take away from this text where we're going to see that our God is a good and gracious God. There is no one like him. And in that we'll be blessed, full of thanksgiving. So this first thought, if you're taking notes, you can follow along with your folder. Just look at the screen here. The ridiculous goal that God pursued to have you and me. And when I say ridiculous, I mean in a good way, in an unbelievable, a mind-fathoming kind of way that we could never really understand or create. And here God is with this goal. It's ridiculous. To to illustrate some of these abstract truths that we're going to see, I'm going to give you a a number of stories so that you can anchor this truth. These truths that you know so well, but so often, right, when we know something so well, we can kind of take it for granted. We can often miss out on, wow, how radical, how ridiculous it really is. Do you know the story of that unnamed Greek god from Greek mythology? It's a... a story that's not so well known, but I, I know Greek mythology has kind of made a comeback, uh, at least in a fantasy sense with, uh, fantasy sense with uh, the Percy Jackson novels. I know my kids like to, to read through those novels. Anyway, there's this Greek god at Mount Olympus, and he's lonely. 
And so he comes to earth and he roams back and forth and he's looking for a bride, someone that he can love. And he finds this beautiful maiden. He falls in love. He decides to take on human flesh and blood to be with her. And they're married and life is good and he'll come and go back and forth from Mount Olympus, never revealing to her his true identity, but he's in love. She's his bride. But one day when he comes back from Mount Olympus, he he happens upon his beautiful bride, but she's been involved in some horrific, horrific, tragic accident. There she is, lying in a pool of her own blood. She's barely breathing. She's going to die unless someone intervenes. Do you remember what that God does? As he looks on his love, he's disgusted. He's repulsed by her frailty, her weakness, her brokenness, all the blood. And so he wings his way back to Mount Olympus and he swears never to return to planet Earth again. Why would he? Now, that's an awful story to begin a sermon with, isn't it? It's so sad, so tragic. And yet, when we think about how reasonable it is, it's absolutely reasonable. It's not ridiculous. As much as we would hate a story like that, what else is a holy, perfect God to do? Who knows nothing of weakness, of pain, of suffering, of sin. And if you want to see how reasonable that story is, it's not just a made-up tale in Greek mythology. That summarizes every world religion. All the false gods of human invention. There's only one God that is not like that Greek false god. And I'll give proof. If you think about it, and this is not to knock the people in the world of any religion, but it is to knock at the false gods behind those religions. What do we find in every world thought, every world religion, apart from Christ in Christianity? We find gods that are up in heaven who really want nothing to do with our mess, who say to people in this broken world, good luck. If you want a relationship with me, then this is what you need to do. And here's the prescription. Pray so many times a day. Do this, do that. Pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. Be better than bad. Do all that I prescribe, and then maybe, maybe you'll survive the judgment. But if you want a relationship with me, you better find a way to me. Is that not as sincere as some people suggest various religions are? Is that not a summary truth of all world religions? That's the burden of humanity. But thank God for God for the thoughts that the Apostle Paul communicates in Ephesians 1. When the Apostle Paul says stuff like this, we see a ridiculous goal from the Lord God. God set out from the very beginning to make sure you're holy and blameless. And how did he do that? Not by prescribing you works that you need to do so that you can win his favor, but by redeeming us. That's a fancy word to buy us back so that we might be destined for adoption. We had orphaned ourselves by our sin. We weren't part of God's family even uh, after our sin, although he created us to be his children. God sought to win us back, to give us then every spiritual blessing in Christ to be his bride. And how did that work out? Well, in time, what did God do when he saw us broken on the side of the road in all our sinfulness, all our brokenness, in a pool of our own making, our own blood. Isn't that when the true God came down and found a bride for himself and washed her clean? By taking her place, by taking on our frail human flesh and blood and all our infirmities and suffered, yes, died along the side of a road on a cross, suffered our hell, so that when he would rise from the dead, his beautiful bride would forever live. That's the true God. That's what Paul is inviting the Christians in Ephesus to celebrate, to give thanks for, as he uses all these beautiful descriptions of God's ridiculous plan. Praise God. And the thing is, too, this wasn't something that Paul just invented or something that Jesus just thought about when he came. This was always God's plan. 
I think of a passage some 700 years before Jesus. Isaiah was talking this way. It goes back all the way to the first promise from God to Adam and Eve when they broke his creation, broke themselves. Isaiah 55, uh, 7b through 9. This is how Isaiah describes our true God and how ridiculous this is. Isaiah to a broken people says, turn to the Lord. Friends, if if, if you're feeling broken today, if you recognize that, what am I? I am lost and condemned by my sins. Isaiah says, turn to the Lord. And guess what? He doesn't prescribe to you what you should do. He doesn't say, well, maybe say this many prayers or do this or do that. And then maybe, then maybe God will have mercy on you. No, he says, turn to the Lord and he will have mercy. And then he goes on to say, to our God, for he will freely pardon You don't earn it. Yes, we don't deserve it, but he gives it freely. And he says, this is the Lord. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. I have this ridiculous plan and I will see it through. They shall be mine, no matter their brokenness. Praise God for God. Who is like that? There's no one like that. And all false religions give testimony to that truth. Praise God for God. So this is the first truth I want to walk away with together from this message. If you're filling in the blank, fill this in. I want you to live in the blissful knowledge of your transformation. You are blameless. You're holy. You're you're adopted. You're a part of the eternal family of God and his inheritance is yours. And you can take that to the bank because it's all about him. So never take God and his grace for granted. There's nothing like it. Praise God. And now let's move on to the second part from Ephesians. As we pull together more descriptors about God's ridiculous plan, we're going to take a moment and again reflect on the radical cost he paid to see it through so that you and I could be his and of infinite worth. Talk about how practical this truth will be for our everyday life when we wake up and we don't feel like we're worth much. To anchor this truth into something more concrete, I want to share with you a story about a sketch of a candelabra. That went from 60 bucks to, well, way more than that. Back in 1942, uh, the New York Smithsonian for art found this sketch, among a number of other works, from the Renaissance period. They could tell, I mean, it was classic Renaissance, but they didn't know uh, who was the mastermind behind it. So they bought it for $60 and just hung it up so people could get a feel for the minds and the creative minds of the Renaissance period. It would hang there in the Smithsonian for decades Until in 2002, Timothy Clifford, who was the director general of all the galleries of Scotland, he's on sabbatical, and so he's traveling the world around, looking at various pieces of art to see if they might be able to find some to showcase in their galleries. As he's going through the Smithsonian, he sees this candelabra. It's anonymous. Tell us from the Renaissance period. But he, knowing Michelangelo's work, his jaw dropped. He said, that's Michelangelo's uh, sketch there. That's Michelangelo's work. And he was so excited, he got the director of the... He couldn't believe it. Well, they had to prove it, so they got all the scholars they could from all the art museums around the world to take a look at this sketch to see, is this really Michelangelo? And of course, Michelangelo, if you don't... Well, just ask your kids, right? They named turtles after Michelangelo today. So this is a big deal, right? Unanimously, they attributed, without a doubt, this is Michelangelo's masterpiece. That little picture went from $60 to $12 million plus overnight. It's crazy. The same thing, something similar, even better, is going on with you and with me, with God's ridiculous plan. All proven by a cost he paid for you and for me. When we think about some of the scriptural truths that come to mind in this regard, I think about Psalm 8. Do you ever think about this? 
Um, so the psalmist says there in Psalm 8, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you would care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. Now, that is if everything is good and right and perfect. In the days of creation, uh, still what is mankind that God would crown us with glory and splendor? I mean, naturally, we're not even equal to the angels. And then when you couple that thought with Romans 3, and you hear the Apostle Paul say, well, yeah, then because of sin, not one seeks God, not one does what is right. Together, we've all become worthless. Paul does not sugarcoat it. He speaks bluntly. Together, we have become worthless. What's our value? We're not even worth a $60 picture because of our sin. But then Paul comes along in Ephesians 1 and says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Look at these people. God's fingerprints are all over them. They are the work of God. And it's all verified through the prophets and apostles and the scriptures. It's all verified. Yes, you are truly a work of God. And you've been bought with this infinite worth, the blood of Christ. You've gone from less than zero to far more than millions. In fact, how much is Christ worth? Have you ever thought of this? How much would it cost to have Jesus? More than the wealth of a thousand worlds. It's infinite. Well, he poured out his blood for you. What does that make you? Equal to Jesus. You see, that's what Paul's talking about here. When he says, God spared no expense to make you his possession. He marked you, for starters, with his presence, the seal of the Holy Spirit. It's an indicator that all that God is about, you are an heir of. And how did he do this? By the blood of the one he loves. The forgiveness of sins, he's paid your debt. You are of infinite value. The riches, he calls it, of God's grace. Praise God, thank God. Very practical. How many of you woke up this morning feeling like a million bucks? Maybe some of you did. It's been a long time since I've woken up feeling like a million bucks. Sometimes I wake up and say, what is it worth? What am I worth? Well, all that changes when you put your thoughts on the cross. Any day you feel like you're not worth anything, you look at that cross. And you can be sure God does not spend good blood, the blood of his only son for nothing. You are of more worth than you know. So never mind your feelings. Never mind what could cause us to think, does anyone even remember me? He does. And that's all that matters. And there's this beautiful application as we think then of that thought. We want to live in the reality of your infinite worth. Every day, thinking of the cross, thinking that blood was spilled for me, was poured out for me. I am of infinite worth and value. Never mind what the world says to you or what even loved ones maybe think of you as you face hardship and brokenness, even abuse. You are of infinite value. There's even more of an application that we can draw out of this. That means you're meant for something. Just as Jesus would not pour out his precious sacred blood for nothing, So to having you, he wouldn't pour out his blood for you for nothing, but for things of infinite worth to others. Ready for another story? Thank you this truth. Think of it in terms of being saved. And for what reason? I think of a story by uh, the man, uh, the name Bishop uh, David Moore. He lived uh, the middle to late 1800s into the 1900s. Yeah, he, he was a bishop of uh, the Methodist Church, I believe. He had served in the Civil War as a Union soldier. But one of the things that set him on a course to make a difference in this life was an experience that he had when he was really young. He was out swimming in a lake, and uh, he wasn't going to make it. But miraculously, there was a stranger on the beach, this man who had noticed him struggling, swam out to him, saved his life, rescued him, brought him back to shore. Uh, This young boy at the time, David Moore, said, thank you, sir. Thank you for saving my life. And the man said, well, you're welcome, son. And he said these words that he would never forget. 
Now go and live a life worthy of saving. Go and live a life worthy of saving. So he joined the war to fight for good. He, he became a leader in the church to do some good. I, Jesus gives you infinite worth, which means you have infinite worth to give. If you ever wake up then on a day wondering, what am I worth? Look to the cross again and start thinking great thoughts. And in that, your heart will overflow with thankfulness because you've been called for this place and time to make a difference. Now, I want to encourage you. I don't want you to think worldly thoughts about what greatness means. Don't feel like, well, I got to write a book that's going to be a bestseller or make a movie or do this or that or uh, save all the starving children in all the world, climb the highest of heights, the greatest of feats. No, that's very worldly, even though it could be of some good. It's so important that when we think about being of infinite worth to others that we think godly thoughts. Here's what I mean. When you think about God, what was a great work of his? The greatest of all works. Again, it's the cross. Now, from a worldly perspective, what's the cross look like? Oh, anything but the cross. You know, talk about a waste. Talk about defeat. Talk about humiliation. No thanks, no cross. But God chooses a cross. And even though the world would scoff and look on, look anywhere else, what does Jesus do with that cross? He makes it the saving tool for you and for me and all God's people. There's no greater work than this humble, old, rugged cross. You know, think about the spirit with whom you've been marked, your inheritance. What does the spirit love to do? What is he all about? What kind of works does he set his mind to? Well, how about an old, irrelevant book that's completely outdated according to the world? He simply loves to speak through that. He loves simple water. <laughs> By promise, bringing people into God's eternal kingdom. The world wants nothing with those things. Uh, he, he thinks about blessing bread and wine, giving you Christ's body and blood, real presence, real forgiveness. The world scoffs. And so when we set our thoughts to acts of infinite worth, don't think worldly. Or we'll miss our true calling and purpose, but think godly things. Think about just simply loving others who are unlovable. The crotchety old man, the co-worker who's only down and out, who only brings down the room. Love them. Smile at them. And I can't wait till we can remove those face masks so we can finally see some smiles. We'll get there, we'll get there. Or how about fathers and mothers among us? Raise your children in the Lord Jesus. Fathers, dads, don't feel like you need to conquer the world. Just conquer your home in Christ. Make an eternal difference. Those are the things of God. Or we can talk about a church family here. I mean, there's millions of applications, but I, I just can't help but think of this last Monday at our staff meeting. We, we were giving thanks to the Lord God for so many blessings. It is evident God's love is in your hearts. We've been able to weather these days of pandemic. Our offerings have been pretty steady. We give thanks to the Lord God. Yeah, they were down last month, but you know what that means? That means we just have opportunity to make a difference, to recommit, to say, Lord, you've called me to these humble things. The world might think, oh, that's silly, but I know better. I can invest in this beautiful gospel message where people can find her of infinite worth even if the world just tramples all over. Or I think about our ushers today. You know, before the pandemic, we had a lot more people that could come in person. And we were given thanks to the Lord God for that, and also for those still serving. But we recognize that many people are vulnerable now, and some of the old guard can't be with us necessarily. They're the ones who often would usher. So we see in days of difficulty and struggle, we have a calling for others to step up who are capable. And that's what we're praying for. And those acts are things that God has called us to, to make an eternal difference, to let guests know who come in broken that they're of infinite worth and value. They see a smiling face. To make coffee, 
uh, to serve in any way to let people know we see them as God sees them. And so live a life worthy. Uh, just think of that thought then, this application, that we can fill in another blank. I believe there's one that can come up here. Live your life worthy of such a price paid for you, resting on God's grace, resting in the riches of his grace. Don't think worldly thoughts. Think humble, simple works. And then ask to our church family, I mean, don't, don't hesitate. If you see a need, and I've just proclaimed some, talk to a Maria Kuschel, a Tom Dietzler, a Leslie Allman down at the court. See if you're able to serve. The world won't praise you, but God does. One last thought then as we begin to wrap up this beautiful text from Ephesians 1. So we think about God's ridiculous goal to have us, the cost, the radical cost he paid so that we could be of infinite value and infinite worth to others. I want you to think about the patience of God to see all this brought about, the relentless persistence of God fulfilling his promises to you and to me in time. One last story. There's a man and his wife. They love camping. Some of their equipment was getting a little old, and so they headed to the store. They picked up a sleeping bag and a cooler. And then they headed over to the shoe department because the man's wife needed uh, some hiking shoes. So that's where they were. Uh, he kissed his wife. She goes off into the aisles to look for shoes. There he is with the sleeping bag and cooler. Uh, a sales rep comes over to him and says, hey, can I help you? You know how sales reps do. He says, no, 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 I'm just waiting for my wife. There was another customer there. He was waiting for his wife. He looks over at the man. He says, well, bless your heart. He looks down at the cooler, looks at the sleeping bag. How long will she be? That's what he thought. Sleeping bag, cooler. You get, I'll move on. Okay. Do you like waiting is the thought? <laughs> Do you like camping out, waiting for whatever to come, whenever it will? I mean, I, that's not me. I can be entirely impatient. I mean, I can't even wait for a hot pocket to cool off before I scorch my mouth, right? I, I can't wait for things. Do you realize the love of God for you? Do you, you know how long he's had to wait for this very moment where you could be born and live and know him? All that he had to go. You, you should always think of God just standing there throughout human history with a sleeping bag and a cooler, just waiting to have his people. And you just go back to the beginning. This is what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 1. Before the creation of the world, God thought about you, which is why he puts up with all the brokenness. When he creates everything so beautifully in six 24-hour days, but then we're the crown of his creation. And even after Adam and Eve fell into sin and ruined it all, and we can't blame them, we do the same every day. God waited. Sleeping bag and cooler with love. And promised the sun. And then he waited. Waited through a worldwide flood. Waited again through the dividing of languages. Waited for this weak, hardly a model of a family, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Waited for Israel. Waited 400 years in slavery. Waited for Moses to lead a rebellious people 40 years in the desert. The immorality of the judges, the rebellion of the kings, even as he would send prophets to them, the conquering from Assyria and Babylon, 400 years of silence till finally Jesus would come in the fullness of time. <laughs> But even as he would suffer living a life for you and for me, not for him, suffering even hell, rising from the dead, he still had to wait for you. 2,000 years would pass. And the gospel would always be in jeopardy. But by his miraculous working, he saved that message, preserved it for you today. And he even still tolerates with mercy and compassion times when we forget about them. And we have the audacity to ask, where are you, God? He's here. He's been waiting. He's been relentless in his persistence. So just look at these words. You were elected before the world began. He predestined us. He chose us in Christ before time to be began. And then to bring us to himself in the fullness of time, you were born at this place and at this time for a reason so God could finally stop waiting. 
and have you. I hope that in all these thoughts, fill your heart with joy, with thankfulness. And then this last thought, in your gratitude, continue to wait on him. Drive away those thoughts that are ungrateful. Wait on the Lord. He is not slow in keeping his promises. He has not failed in anyone. He will fulfill his promises for you because he's always waiting on us. So dear friends, live a life of thanks. Give glory to God for he has truly blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we are grateful. You have opened our eyes all the more through the preaching of Paul in Ephesians 1 and you've shown us your ridiculous plan, your goal to have us, the radical cost you paid and your relentless persistence to see us be yours, fulfilling all your promises. Lord, help us to be thankful. No matter what we face, you are with us. You wait on us. Lord, in this, teach us to wait on you. All these things we pray for, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.